here's a point. Chris and I talk about free agency trends, the way the team handles these sorts of things all the time. Yep. Your opinion, the running back position, there are a couple things. You know, we just got done talking about how the wide receiver group is sort of unsettled. There's obviously a need to enhance there. That's why a lot of fans gravitate towards that in the draft. The running back position. Mm. What was it, like only two? Two scouted that would are projected in the first like four rounds? When you look at the running backs that the Bills have taken time to go scout and mm -hmm. see in live action, the only two that they've put eyes on that are considered to be first to second round talents, maybe third round talents, I guess you could throw uh, Taylor out of Wisconsin. He got a single visit from just scouts. Well, running back out of Wisconsin is always going to have a ton of mileage. And I think Taylor has like 930, but that, did, yeah. that didn't stop the Bills from taking uh, Singletary. So. But so the only two who got significant run were the two who play for teams that are constantly getting eyes on them. Ohio State and J.K. Dobbins mm -hmm. and Clyde Edwards-Hilaire out of LSU. Teams that our team as a whole, as a scouting staff, they went to see those teams five different times this season. GM uh, Brandon Bean attended two of those games. Mm. So obviously they're looking at high-end talent. They're there for a number of different players. Yeah. But it's interesting to see that there wasn't really an onus put on scouting running backs this offseason. What is your opinion of the running back room at One Bills Drive as of today? As of today, it's currently Devin Singletary, T.J. Eldon. T.J. Eldon. And Wade. Wade. You got DeMarco there. We're talking about running backs. No, DeMarco's a deep threat. He, uh, I'm going to, I just stopped. I should drop you off. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> To me, it goes up on styles and the type of offense that you want to run. So let's just say, for instance, in 2019, when the Bills went from Singletary to Gore, there wasn't going to be a threat of Gore catching the pass, catching a pass out of the backfield. Mm -hmm. Now, it could have been. And, and a, one of the things that I happen to harp on quite a bit is everyone's like, why do they run more screens to Singletary, more screens to Singletary? Well, when you have a mobile quarterback, what you do with Josh Allen, Guys really aren't pinning their ears back to come after the quarterback, so you can run those screens as often as you want to, and I understand that. So if you're gonna, if you're moving on from Gore and, and you have Yeldon, he's going to be on the last year of his deal. You want to get somebody else in here that could have the similar style of a Singletary so that when you go from one running back to the next, you're not having to drop off in production. Mm -hmm. Now, of the guys that you've mentioned, which one of those do you think is more comparable to Singletary? Do you think <clears> it's... You think Dobbins is more is comparable? You think Taylor is? You think what one of those guys you think is more comparable? Because to me, that's what's going to happen. Now, as far as and that's one, two. As far as the free agency market, I, you know, running backs have been devalued for mm -hmm. for a long time now. Paul and I cut a, a really quick episode. It, it, you know, it was funny because he loved David Johnson with a passion. So, taking that contract off of Arizona, which the Bills can do. I mean, they can. Fully, fully do that um, would give you that outside threat, but Johnson really isn't an inside the tackle runner as Singletary is. So, those two questions: Do you think they would do it in free agency, or do you think that they're really seriously going to make a run at one of those two guys? Well, here's the problem you're faced with, and it was funny because we talked about this during Paul Wineski's uh, appearance on our podcast. Mm. We talked about the fact that right now, when you look at the three teams that have the richest running back contracts on their roster. Both of, uh, two of them missed the playoffs. <laughs> two of them missed the playoffs. I, in fact, I think all of them did, Chris, because you're talking about, what, the Cowboys? You're talking about the Rams, and you're talking about the Cardinals. So you, all three of them missed the postseason. And while you saw production from them, obviously, the, David Johnson aside, it, you're talking about, you look at what Zeke Elliott did. You know, 1,000 yards, he's great. He's amazing, though. I mean, you've got to cover that guy on all three downs. But he's amazing. Here's something that no one's talking about. Of the We ran it down with Paul. Over the running backs that posted either five or more touchdowns or had over, I think I think we cut it to 1,000 yards rushing. Okay. The vast majority, you're talking 20-something some running backs, all on rookie contracts. There is a movement here in the NFL that's saying, look, we need to get cheaper at these running back positions. 
because paying them in free agency and ending up like the Rams with Todd Gurley, oh, it's not paying off. Can we just say that? The, the, I mean, Les Snead over there, you, you don't have a first round pick for five more years. Let's just, they, they could be the outlier because that is a dumpster fire over I there. I think the thing with Les Snead is he's just figured out that he's so bad at drafting, he's just decided to punt on the entire exercise. <laughs> and Chris, what if I told you that as a GM, I'm just not going to draft? You as an owner, what would you say to me? I would probably fire you. I feel like you would have to... Take your teeth and get out of here. (laughs) It's like that meme with the guy pointing at his head. He goes, you can't draft that if you don't have any picks. Exactly, that's it. And I think that the thing that gets glossed over here is there's an owner there in Kroenke who's not a dumb guy. Yet for some reason he's got a GM who he's just allowed to take draft picks and just continue throwing at players who are going to command salary, who already command salary, instead of doing the thing that most continually successful franchises do, which is draft well. Well, the thing is this. As far as L.A. go, look where they are. They're in L.A. I mean, a lot of times people would talk about, you know, if you go through the history, the archives, I'm a big, I love the history of the game. Howie Long used to talk about Al Davis. He said, listen, he, didn't, he never sold the Raiders in L.A. you got to sell the Raiders. You're talking about L. Davis. Okay. You have to sell the Raiders in Los Angeles. He never wanted to sell the team. If you take all of these guys that are first-round talent, personalities, Jalen Ramsey, Todd Gurley, all these guys, it really, it's about revenue. What, how much can they generate with getting these personalities, people that people want to see? I mean, so you get guys from USC. You get guys in, in a Robert Woods. You get, you get all these other you know, pieces of talent. You're trying to win. However... Generating revenue and getting people in the seats is the biggest thing. He's trying to sell the team to the public, like the Lakers or anything like that. And I understand that, and they have a need for that out in L.A., which is why you hear the Chargers being linked to Tom Brady in free agency. Now, on its face, does that make a lot of sense? You're talking about a franchise that hasn't gone out of its way. It's the reason Eli Manning wouldn't play there. We talked about it earlier, Mm -hmm. or unless uh, the, the previous show, about how there's... We talked about it before how Eli Manning was told to stay away from the franchise because it didn't seem like there was an onus on winning there. Yeah. Well, now all of a sudden, going out and making a move for Tom Brady, that flies in the face of that, but it's not being made in the spirit of winning. That's a move that's being made in the spirit of how can I sell hope to people because I have to put butts in seats. Yeah, absolutely. That's why that fit makes sense. That's star power. That's not even. But that's to get to me about the NFL. It's not a football move. It's not. And you and I both know that. We get you know, people that are, people are smart. They can see through the lines as far as that goes. I mean, they're not getting Brady because they think at 42 he can lead them to the promised land. He can lead them to sellouts. See, now, I don't know about you, but I'm not a, I don't block people on social media. I mean, I'm a troll. I mean, I, at heart. Like, I'm a real-life, actual troll. I used to do repossessions. I used to do repos. I mean, I've dealt, I've had conversations with people that have been as acrimonious as anything you've ever heard in your life. If we can make that TV show, Operation Repo, real, you can be the star of it. <laughs> it's one of those things where I, no one's ever going to say anything to me on social media that's going to hurt my feelings. But... I unfriended five different people, like, on Facebook. People I've been friends with since high school. I unfriended them entirely because I heard them talking about the Bills signing Tom Brady to let Josh Allen sit behind him and learn. You, sir, are a lunatic. You know who I don't hang out with is crazy people because I've only got enough room for enough crazy in my life and most of it's mine. So there's a lot of nonsense out there when it comes to this stuff but to your point, it's about star power. It's about recognition and that seems to be what the Rams are more about than winning. Mm-hmm. What they made a singular Super Bowl, kind of on the back of Todd Gurley. Yeah, I had, on that offense, and now that you had to pay your quarterback, you're finding out Les Snead. And I think if you look, if you look through Les Snead's history, I don't think Les Snead's ever had to deal with, as a GM. This is his first rodeo with having a quarterback on a massive contract. He's never worked for an organization that had to do it. He's never been the shot caller. For a team that had to find a way to be competitive while also paying a quarterback. Now, again, if you want to use this as a case study, it's going to be interesting to see how the Bills handle that in that same capacity. Because what you're talking about is a team that right now can get away with a lot. You know, people are talking about trading out of the first round altogether. People are talking about trading up in the first round for talent. 
people are talking about mortgaging and leveraging some of our draft picks, which being able to take contracts off other teams is huge. Oh, we talked about that with David Johnson. I'm sure you guys have mm-hmm. touched on it on your shows. Yeah. About the flexibility you currently have because you have all this cap space. Yeah, you have holes as a team. You're not perfect. But you have the money and the draft capital to go address those holes. Well, all of that changes when you start paying, um, when you write that first you know, that first bonus check when Josh Allen signs in the dotted line for a contract extension. I like the idea of cycling running backs, but it's almost like the guys that try to be too smart for, for their own good. Why are you going to sign a big-name running back like a Gurley or an Elliott or a Barkley when it ends up coming up? Is the fact that all the defenses are being built to defend the pass. Yes. So if you're <clears throat> if you're one of those rare teams, we saw it with the with the Patriots uh, when they beat the Rams in the Super Bowl. Is that they were going two tight end sets. They were running the ball with Sony Michelle in between the tackles. They were th- peppering the ball outside of James White a little bit. They had the seven yard root tree with Julian Edelman, mm-hmm. and uh, I mean they were using Gronk mostly as a blocker. They played old school football. That's, how do you think you win a thirteen to three game against one of the highest scoring? Offenses in the NFL yeah. is you shorten the game. He took the he took the blueprint from the Super Bowl twenty five and used it against the Rams. It's it genuinely is one of those things. And then at, on the flip side of that, again, you're talking about how people think a wide receiver is what's absolutely necessary to make this offense run. Mm-hmm. If you could find yourself, and I'm not saying that there's a guy like him in this draft because otherwise he'd be a bona fide first, you know, probably top twenty pick. But what would the inclusion, no wide receiver talent added in the draft? None. If they were to forego the entire thing, but they were to walk out of here with an offensive tackle and a running back, the quality of a, a you know, a run CMC, a McCaffrey, or even a Melvin Gordon, you walk out of there with a guy who can come in and do some of these things for you. I like Stag. What is all of a sudden, what does our offense look like? You could argue that's a far more uh, more capable unit than what we fielded this year. Yeah. I, I mean, being a functional offense, th- there's a million different ways to get there. Yeah. You know, it's like the difference. You're a teacher. You, kn- you know more than anybody. There's a million different ways to arrive at the same solution for a problem. Mm-hmm. You know, you can show me common core math. I can show you old school math. We can get to the same number. It's yep. just we took different approaches. The Bills being more consistent on offense is ultimately the goal. Yeah. There's just a lot of different ways to get there. And I'm of the school of thought that drafting a first-round wide receiver, maybe that's not it. There's still something else out there for people to consider. What I, what I like about it is if you have two guys of equal talent, let's say you have two Singletaries, you go with three wide receiver set or two wide receiver set with Knox split out, twins one side, like say you got Knox and Brown on one side, you got Beasley on the other, and you want to go with a split back of those two running backs of Singletary caliber. Now, number one, you can help in the protection game because you got five linemen, two backs. If they bring pressure, all right, this is what we're going to do. If not, you could send both of those out in the pattern. Number one, number two, number two or number three. Who's going to cover them? Who's going to cover a Singletary and a Singletary like back out of the backfield? What that does is it forces teams to shift coverages. Now, when you shift coverages, somebody's going to be open on the outside. Yes. So now you automatically open up holes for Beasley and Brown and Knox just by having that presence there. And I think that's to your point. That's that's what gets lost sometimes. And, I mean, you're a football guy. Chris is a football guy. Chris is trying to be a football guy. I know. Right? Mario, you would, would be re- proud at how far he's come. Folks, for those of you watching at home who don't know this, when we started – doing the podcast, and when we started watching football together, it was quickly apparent to me that Chris knew nothing about X's and O's, positional responsibility. He knew that there was guys in the offensive line, and their job was to push those guys. And how much of this have you helped me with? Zero. Exactly. Chris gets no help from me because I'm one of the most impatient people <laughs> on the face of the planet. I have no time to stop in the middle of my own manic football watching to explain a word of it to Chris. So it's with the help of guys like Mario and Eric Turner and guys like that that he's been able to become a more nuanced football fan. The other day he came to me and said something about defensive tackles and how variance in technique and how and, – and I wanted to hug him because <laughs> it just shows a lot of personal growth, which is something Chris is not known for. Little boys all no. grows up. No, I have no, no personality. <laughs> no personality of a dead moth. <laughs> 
So it's funny now getting to have conversations with Chris about these sorts of things. And we hearing his take on some of these draft picks and draft things that could be done, should be done. See, I would much rather take a running back in the draft to comp with Singletary rather than get a grizzled veteran in free agency. I think the only way running backs are going to make any kind of coin in free agency, like, you know, Derrick Henry, is if he goes to a team that is going to draft a quarterback this year because you'll have that quarterback on a rookie deal and you can pay all that money to that running back because – What's better for a rookie quarterback than a running game? And then when that contract is up, all that money from the running back shifts over to that quarterback. That might be one of the most nuanced things that has ever come out of your mouth. That's what I'm talking about. I'm so, <laughs> so proud of you. <laughs> it's like, it's, I'm assuming that this is what it looks like, Mario. You're a father. I'm soon to be a father. Is this what it's like when you give that kid a push on a bicycle after you take the training wheels off and he actually makes it to the corner? I got some dust in my eye. <laughs> I got a bit of pepper. <laughs> so beautiful.